Okay, so Thragile is available under Thragile.io and basically that's the starting page and information about how it can be used will be there available. Um, there's also some kind of playground available where you can directly execute it with some test models as you like and you directly see the results. Or you can download it as a Docker container. Everything is in it. That's the intended way of using it. So you go just to Docker Hub and search for Thragile and then you can pull that container image onto your local machine and run it wherever you like on-prem. That's pretty easy and it's just like uh, running with um, docker run and I add minus minus rm to remove the container after it was executed and make it interactive and just run the image and then you get a help. That kind of help is basically the command line information you get here uh, again with some kind of um, links where you can find further information and with some settings into which we are going to dive deeper in the next few minutes and some examples as well that you can also use if you want to get the starting points running. In order to not always use the docker command I just created a small wrapper script for my personal use. It's a shell script. You can do this on Windows with a .cmd file as you like. So I do have a Thragile um, shell script that basically is executing the system with the arguments presented, basically any argument, and it's using a volume in order to map my local folder into the Docker container so that the Docker container of Thragile can work on that folder. So that's just a shortcut that I do not have to type that during the next minutes every time. And we do have in Thragile, if I just again get the help, do have some example to create a stub model. So creating a stub model is basically very straightforward. It's creating a simple file. I can just execute that, giving that command. And a minimal stub model was created named Thragile stub model YAML in the output directory. So if I now take a look at that, I see there is a stub model that I can then in my IDE or whatever editor you like to edit YAML files with, uh, I can fill that. So I can create those contents like for example some data assets um, where I describe the data assets that I'm using in my thread model, especially the um, confidentiality, integrity and availability. And it has every data asset, you can have multiples, can have some ID and that ID is being referenced throughout the other systems and it's that I can also create technical assets here and these technical assets do have some kind of um, confidentiality, integrity, availability rating, they do have some type whether it's an external entity, a process or a data structure, they do have some usage stuff here as well so uh, whether it's DevOps or business uh, usage, whether it's used by a human or out of scope in total, and it has some kind of technology setting and you can even tag things. Technology setting, something I'm going to present in a few minutes, is where uh, the, the rules basically kick in, the risk rules, to determine different risks based on different technologies and how they interoperate. Also, I map on the um, assets uh, that are being processed or stored. So here this is processing one data asset and I have communication links. So every technical asset can have outgoing communication links. I just have to define the target ID, a protocol that's also from an enum that I'm going to present. It's extendable and also a little bit more uh, in terms of what data is sent and eventually received. Some other technical assets we see here in the stub model, it's a minimal model. Then we define the trust boundaries. A trust boundary also, and we can have multiple ones, has an ID and it's a different type. It can be a cloud-based network security group or just some container platform-based isolation policy or basically some classic network-based trust boundary or an execution environment. And again, you map the uh, technical assets that are inside this trust boundary and eventually if you do nest trust boundaries then you can nest some other trust boundaries here as well. 
Then you can define a shared runtime or multiple shared runtimes like virtualization engines where the same hardware in terms of availability risk is sharing uh, or being shared across different technical assets. You can also add custom risks, but more on this later. And you can have some risk tracking here, but that's something I'm going to present later as well. That's a minimal model and we can extend that in the IDE. That should be simple and easy. Uh, or whatever kind of editor you like. I'm using IntelliJ, but that really does not relate to that kind of IDE. Whatever you like, it could be even VI. <laughs> and um, But it would be more funny for the presentation to have an example model, and I'm going to show you that as well. So inside the Thragile help, we saw that aside from a stub model, we can also create a, not a minimal stub model, but a filled example model. That's something I'm going to use now. Fragile and create the example model and an example model was created and that's a little bit more filled. So if you take a look at that in the IDE we see some data assets in it and we see some, some more data assets here and we see some more um, technical asset. We even have a navigation in the IDE here that's pretty pretty nice. So we can just go to the Apache web server and we see the rating and the data that's being processed and stuff like that. And we have some trust boundaries here as well. So we can see it's a little bit more of a filled model and we can just use this kind of model uh, to create some nice results by executing Thragile on that. So it's basically Thragile and then just I'm giving it the model argument and that's inside the container app work Thragile example model dot yaml and output is app work and I make it verbose. And that way it works on my local file on the local file system in the folder here and it generates a few things. So how does the Docker container do that? It's simply by the mapping of the volume so that inside the Docker container of Fragile app work is the folder which is actually the current folder here. So that way we can interact that way. Nice. And in the next few minutes I'm going to go deeper into what kind of risk output was generated. So what was generated from uh, the execution is basically some kind of diagrams more on that later. So we see, for example, a data flow diagram that has been automatically laid out and the colors are basically due to the different data flows and different risk ratings in terms of uh, sensitivity of the data and also in terms of the um, places where custom code is developed or not, whether it's on the internet or not, or out of scope or not. So that's a little bit of a scheme behind that layout and it has been automatically generated. Also, we do have a PDF report that has been generated. That's um, a little bit long because it's in terms of uh, redundancy, uh, giving two different entries for viewing the risks that have been identified according to the risk rules, and also has some kind of documentation character. So it's a little bit of uh, lengthier. And we do have in that kind of report some management summary and impact analysis of some uh, pre-risk mitigation after the risk mitigation state risks and the diagrams are also inside uh, same is for some kind of other documentation and most importantly we do have the risks that have been identified including individual risks more on that later and the color again in terms of uh, criticality and we do have those risks as entry points and we do have the technical assets also as entry points that basically is the other view of the same data and we have a data loss probability that has also been generated by each data asset and a little bit more of documentation. So basically some management summary as expected so you can even customize that with some custom text and uh, some distribution diagrams and an impact analysis of the risks 83 risks initially identified in 27 categories of that example file, including some individual risk, a critical one, so even custom risks can be added to that kind of scheme. And you can click on any of those to get to more details, uh, but more on that later. And we do have a risk mitigation uh, where we see a distribution of 
the initial identified risks and the remaining ones. So basically some have been mitigated, some have been in progress, or many here are unchecked, which is not good. And the impact analysis of the remaining ones. So after that kind of presented mitigation that is also maintainable inside the YAML file. Also, we do have some kind of uh, embedding of the diagrams and a little bit of more documentation stuff, not going into details here. We've got a stride distribution so that you see those risks. Even here, it's clickable to go to the details. Accordingly, the spoofing, tampering, and to the other categories like repudiation, information disclosure, denial of service, and elevation of privilege within stride. Again, different view, same data. You have an assignment by function, so that gives who is most probably uh, responsible for mitigating the risk, business side, architecture side, development side, or operation side, again, clickable. And an analysis of the relative attacker attractiveness, that's something I'm not going to cover in that short video here. It's a uh, algorithm that's calculating how attacker attractive the different elements in the uh, diagram or in the threat model are accordingly due to some graph calculation. A data mapping where we see some kind of data assets on the left, the data assets on the left, where they are stored and processed on which elements on the right, and here everything is red on the left side because they are either touching a, a right, uh, on the right side, a red or higher rated data asset. So you see when you basically downrate some risks here by mitigating them uh, properly, then you would have high impact on the left side, getting the color from red to amber or even better. And a little bit of more documentation. And then each risk has some kind of um, basically some kind of initial page where you see an overview that includes a description the impact, a detection logic, and what could be false positives, and a mitigation, and that mitigation includes links directly to the OWASP cheat sheet and the OWASP ASVS chapter, so that things can be read up from there as well. And every risk here is um, rated according to individual rules and also has some uh, description here. This was identified one time. Again, an XML risk was identified one time here. And we do have some cross-site scripting risks, that potential cross-site scripting risks that have been identified four times. So we have them each here. You can click on any of that to go to the technical asset view or the shortcut here just to go back, clicking on that, to the table of contents for easier navigation. So let's go into the risks by technical asset. For example, we can go to the back office ERP system. It has 14 remaining out of 18 risks. Click on that. And here we see the risks being here rated high risk, elevated, medium. And for example, the XML risk is here and uh, matching at this back office ERP system or some um, untrusted deserialization vulnerability or some medium risks here like cross-site scripting or cross-site request forgery or unencrypted communications and stuff like that. And a little bit of documentation that's just basically for the documentation folks. You can click on any of those risks. So for example, we can click on, uh, let's say here, the um, SCSRF risk, and then we've got cross-site request forgery explained and where it matches seven times, where it's matching. So we have those seven times here as well. And finally, we do have some kind of um, data loss probabilities here. That's also calculated. Everything is red because we didn't mitigate too many risks yet. And for example, the customer accounts are red due to 39 unmitigated risks still out of 57 identified. I can click on that and I see where it's processed on which um, technical assets, where it's sent or received via which connection links. And here I see its data loss is probable due to, zooming in, having 39 remaining risks. Those are the remaining ones and each one has a probable or possible or improbable style of, um, that's the risk ID here, um, a style of uh, whether that kind of risk is risking that you lose data. So some injection obviously might definitely 
I have some risk of losing data. Cross site scripting possible depends. Unencrypted communication also possible. Needs to be a network based attack happening, and some other ones is just more improbable. So I can click on any of those, and uh, let's say missing cloud hardening. Click, and then I've got some missing cloud hardening information here. So it's very easy to navigate throughout these kinds of structures. Also, we do have some more assets. So we do have a, which were also generated, easier to handle um, Excel file that I'm going to import. It's just the same data, different view, and it's giving me a sortable and easier filterable kind of um, documentation of what risk has been identified on what kind of asset or what kind of communication link and what's the risk ID. Nice. And we have for the IT <laughs> relevant uh, technical DevOps engineers some nice uh, JSON files. For example, we do have a stats JSON that has been generated just to get the statistic of uh, the risks in total here, critical, elevated, high, low, and their uh, matching state in they, which they are in, uh, whether mitigated or not. And we do have a JSON file for the details which is actually here, risks JSON. That's basically uh, the, the whole detail set of the identified risks. But where do those risks come from that you have seen in the PDF or in the Excel file and the JSON file? So basically there are risk rules inside Threadgile, a built-in list of ever-growing 30, 40-ish something risk rules that are working on the parsed graph of the YAML file and have some inherent rules accordingly due to the um, types of technology that have been chosen or the types of protocol and the different other settings you provided declaratively in the thread model YAML file. So for example we have a path traversal rule here. So it's Threadgile's written in Golang, the Go language. Very simple, very easy to write. Here we have the metadata of the path traversal rule. So we have a path traversal risk. I can show you. Let's take a look inside this one here. Path traversal risk, a description, impact, a little bit of more mitigation stuff, links to the cheat sheet and links to the um, ASVS chapter. And this was risk was identified one time. Uh, some file server access. And that's basically the detection logic inside that method here. So here we see it's a little bit of looping, a little bit of if, it's not really too much complicated, it's uh, easy to understand, and it's just following the, the graph of the objects and uh, for file server and local file systems, um, it's then checking if incoming flows are basically matching the risk rule, and if it does, then it's a risk that has been generated here with some likelihood and some impact and some text for the risk details and a, an ID that has been generated here. So that's pretty simple, a more simple rule. We have another one, a little bit more complex, for example, unguarded direct data store access. That's the one here, a little bit more complex, uh, more on the protocol side and checking things and trust boundary crossings and stuff like that. So it's a little bit of graph navigation stuff, but basically it's pretty simple. And of course, you can also create your own custom risk rules. There is an interface for that, so it's a little bit of Golang uh, programming. It's very simple. You can compile that and then you can give that to your local Threadgile execution with the command switch for custom risk rules. So you have a, a mapping where you can have custom risk rule plugins, the shared object files generated from the Golang compilation of the risk rules, and then these are being worked on on the model file as well. So that allows that big corporations can code or uh, customize those risk rules and code their own risk rules if they want to and have that way in the whole landscape of the the co corporation those risk rules applied everywhere where Threadgile runs. So you can have your own corporate policies as code in that way that is then applied on the declarative YAML file modeled as the thread model input. So how about editing those thread model YAML files in your IDE? They, that's pretty awesome and pretty straightforward because every IDE supports YAML files. 
even uh, in VI you can easily edit a YAML file or it can be generated by some other kind of service, whatever you like. And we do even have some nice editing support inside Threadgel. So here there is a create editing support flag which when I just add I'm getting two files generated schema JSON and live templates. That's just a static file not depending on any model it's just the way you generate these files and you can import those files in your IDE. So for example the schema JSON we can use and that's the YAML schema that's basically giving us auto-completion and all those things for the IDE. I've imported it already here and then I can in any model I can click here on the uh, Threadgel schema and then I do have a schema validation and auto-completion. So for example let's take a, uh, this Jenkins build server here as an example and make a a technology build pipeline and I have a typo here, uh, double P. Then basically it's flagged here as invalid, so that's not a valid one and here even I do have in my IDE a validation error and I can even have auto-completion so I can just hit the control space and then I can do whatever and select whatever kind of technology or type it a little bit and then I do have it and now it's valid again. That's pretty nice. Also, we do have some kind of live editing support. So when you take the other file, it's just a text file that has been generated and you can import that as well. It's live templates txt in your IDE, just a one, one time effort, including for the mo most um, prominent IDEs, some links of how you can do that. And then you can edit those templates for the base model and also for data assets, technical assets and all these communication link stuff so that you can even do some Zen style coding. So Threadgel base model, enter, bam, I've got the base model. Some title, tap, some name, tap and you can jump through all these and here I can have a business criticality entered or whatever are data assets, I'm skipping a few things, data assets and then I can here have the data assets, uh, live editing support, click some data ABC, tap data ABC, tap usage. Then I can use control space to have the editing support here, let's say that's business and even have the confidentiality is confidential and all these things or technical asset, tech asset, enter and then can give it a name, some tech asset ABC, tech asset ABC, tap and type is its process, usage is business, use by human is false, so you see it auto completes and taps through that and I can even have here technology, let's say it's a web server or web service, REST web servers, it's not sitting on the internet, so it's not the client, it's exposed on the internet but not sitting on the internet, machine is a container and encryption is with some metric key and uh, unfortunately not with end user identity and I can have some ratings here confidential and important and operational and it's uh, multi-tenant and not redundant and it contains custom developed parts so that way I can easily get a you know, simple way to create those things including communication links so I can have a com link here a com link and to ABC and then I can have the target ID, the protocol and all these things. So it's pretty straightforward to create those elements with the live editing support including individual risk categories and their instances and also including those risk tracking things. So that's pretty simple and we do have full model validation that way. Well, we even have some kind of model macros which are codified, again in Golang, codified ways of to have an interactive wizard style question back and forth with the user in order to seed a model or to modify an existing model in a certain way, adding things. So when you do have certain elements in your corporation that are often modeled in a more or less same style, then you can have that 
codified in a thread model macro, a model macro that's working on the model like a macro modifying it with an interactive wizard style approach. So I can, for example, execute that at build pipeline model here to execute uh, with the execute model macro at build pipeline flag to add the build pipeline to this um, model we are working on. And we do have a few questions, uh, whether it's basically it's about naming things and a little bit about uh, how the build pipeline is being deployed. And it's a state machine that's coded inside the model macro. So each model macro can have a dynamic set of questions. And here the default, I'm accepting Git and Jenkins, basically the names of those build pipeline elements, the artifact registry, whether we're using a code inspection platform, yes. Uh, are we using containerization technology? Yes, it's Docker, uh, uh, Kubernetes as orchestration, run, uh, orchestration runtime, or can use OpenShifter, it's just a name. And uh, build pipeline composed uh, components exposed to the internet? No. Um, are they used by multiple tenants? Yes. Uh, are those encrypted? No. And here I can select on which technical assets existing in the model, these deployments are being deployed on. So everything that's built with that build pipeline, let's say it deploys some front end stuff to the Apache web server. You see the start has been selected. Also it deploys something to the ERP system and it deploys something to the marketing CMS, let's say number 10. And then we're through zero. And then we can even answer the um, trust boundary question. So are those inside a custom trust boundary? Yes. And uh, should a new one be generated? Yes. What type is it? It's, um, let's say, network uh, virtual LAN. So it's number three. And is it a push or pull based deployment? Pull based would be GitOps style pulling things and pushing things. It's the classic style where you have a connection to push the, the deployment artifact. So it's, let's say, the classic one. And um, basically, what's who's the owner? Uh, it's company XYZ, whoever is owning that. And here we see what will be applied. That was the dry run. So these things will be applied to the model, adding technical assets, adding trust boundaries, adding communication links. And I say, yes, I want to execute that. And the model file has been modified. So here I see the updated version, a backup version, of course, has been created as well, if I want to switch back. And I see that I do have more elements here inside the model. And if I now execute that kind of stuff, I would see new uh, risks being generated. We can just do that. App work, Thragile YAML, and output is, it's mapped in the container, app work. And then we see, yeah, it's due to the rendering, that's okay. We see things have been generated. I didn't apply the verbose flag, so I didn't see any details. And here I see a new data flow diagram has been generated. So it looks a little bit more complicated because the build pipeline things have been added, including technical assets and data assets like code that's flowing. And we have the deployment paths being added here. And of course, the risks are also reflecting that. So for example, we do have a few more risks, including those of the build pipeline components and also eventually, depending on the architecture, we have something like uh, push versus pull deployments or something like that. So that's that's a way to edit a model file interactively. Uh, so for example, ex accidental secret leak here, that's a good one. So a build pipeline can leak secrets in Git or Docker or Nexus registries if we do not have the proper countermeasures in place like Git secrets um, or Talisman or other kind of things that we can use to avoid checking secrets in. So it's a new risk that's coming from the fact that we just added a build pipeline, which we did just using a model macro. And you can create your own model macros, of, of course, as well inside Thragile. So uh, that's something that you can code if you want, definitely as well. Custom risks can be added inside the model YAML file as well. So we do have an individual risk category where you can name custom risk categories and give the meter information for the report. So basically what's that, that risk having for an impact and how it should be mitigated and links to the cheat sheets and if you have something like that. And you can also have instances that you're doing a manual analysis. So of course, when you identify um, 
risks in the threat model workshop they should be added here as well risks that can be identified by a tool uh, but it's processed in the same style so you can give that risk a name and you can even map onto which kind of technical assets this risk is applying so that means that their data loss probability calculation things are working as expected and this kind of custom risk was added two times so we have two times on different technical assets this custom risk added and it's flowing through Threadgile in exactly the same style as other risks. But how can we track those risks, the status that they are basically in, like in discussion, accepted, in progress, mitigated, stuff like that, or false positive eventually. And that's also tracked inside the YAML file, inside the risk tracking section. So every risk, either inside the IR generated Excel or inside the generated PDF or inside the generated JSON has a unique risk ID. So here I see unique risk IDs that are also inside the Excel and I can just use these, copy that and then paste it here as an entry in the risk tracking and then I can give it a status of whether it's accepted, mitigated, unchecked, in discussion, whatever kind of status you want to assign here from those. And a justification text, eventually you can reference if you like, optionally a ticket, um, like a bug tracker ticket or whatever where this is being handled, a date when this was checked and checked by whom, the name. And this is being then generated again inside the, um, with the status in, uh, here matching accordingly inside the Excel and also the report is updated that way if you regenerate so you see the bar chart here and the pie charts here uh, reflecting that and you see the impact analysis of the remaining risks so that's basically those that are not yet mitigated compared to the initial ones this should be better obviously and you can even have wildcards, so you can add wildcards if you have a certain set like unencrypted asset, a uh, certain set of risks that you do not want on block being um, um, visible or being shown inside the model as um, uh, open because you mitigated them or you accepted them or whatever, then you can have a wildcard that's being used between those add characters. So you can use uh, the wildcard thing to have a batching of a group of risks that you want to mitigate or want to assign a certain status to if you want to do that. And you even have a model macro that is able to, if you execute that, seed you with all those risk tracking entries of all the risks that have been identified. And Threadgile also has a server mode if you want to execute it not directly on the command line but as a REST server with an API. You can have the server attribute with a port number added, Threadgile server running, and then on that port that you defined you've got a web page that describes the um, model stuff and the example files, you can download the editing support and you can just upload a YAML file and get a zip file to download then that gives you the results. So then the work is executed on the server side and this is even reflected in the API. So in the API you can have that direct analysis as well and you can even, that's for the 1.1 version, the extension in the API that you can use that, it's being in development currently, that the server side also has a way to store encrypted those model files. Uh, you can then edit those model files using the API, listing data assets, adding data assets, adding technical assets, changing things, and you can then directly get the results from the API as well. And you can import YAML files or export that thing as a YAML file as well. That's basically exactly the same than the server that's running on run.threadgile.io where you can experiment with that as well. So for the DevSecOps people that's also something we can use the JSON files that are generated automatically in a Threadgile run and you can even tune it that only the JSON files are generated being a little bit faster and that way you can enrich your DevOps pipelines so that the Threadgile YAML is also checked out of the source code repository sitting there along with the project and then it's being worked on via Threadgile and then you get the results as a JSON file or JSON files that you can process and that way you can even get some more information and can automatically decide 
what to do next in the build pipeline so it's fully working inside of uh, DevOps as or DevSecOps workflows so putting threat modeling into DevOps as well and I really encourage you to use the Docker container and execute it, run it, play with it. You get the command line, you get the examples, you get the docs. That's pretty nice. And uh, you can also go online to run.thredgile.io where you can have an example of playing with it or just to thredgile.io where you then have some more information on that. And also even bigger models work quite well. So this was just for the demo, a more smaller one and with a medium size one here. So even more assets and connections in it automatically being generated here, that layout. And we even have worked with Threadgel with even bigger uh, models. So that's also feasible of handling bigger models. Good. So from my side, thank you.